You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. So be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike, options pricing and analysis software. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. Visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is Friday. It used to be Friday. <laughs> I'm dating myself. It's Thursday now. <laughs> you can tell I'm on some cold medicine. It's Thursday. It's 1.30. That means it's time for TWIFO, This Week in Futures Options. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting The Options Insider Radio Network. Coming at you live here, of course, via the old Mixlers or after the fact on your device of choice. We don't judge. However you listen, make sure you send in those questions, those comments. We do love to hear from you guys. And if you like what you hear, make sure you leave a, a review on your platform of choice so that other folks, other like-minded folks can continue to discover and enjoy the program. And, of course, our old buddy Sean, after a record streak, I think it was three straight weeks here in the studio, delicious gourmet burgers in hand. This week, not so much. It's the big CME dog and pony show down there in Naples this week, the Global Financial Leadership Conference. And he is down there attending that. So he's not going to be not going to be joining me in studio today, which is which is bad for my lack of burgers, but maybe good for my diet overall. <laughs> but joining me, not in the studio, but remotely, our old friend. We used to call him Dr. Vix. Now I guess maybe we should call him, I don't know, Dr. Crude, something else like that. He is Mr. Russell Rhodes, the director of research. Over there at the derivatives research, let me add that caveat, derivatives research over there at the tab group. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back. And, you know, what do I call you these days? It's not Dr. Vicks anymore, so what should it be? You can call me Dr. Vicks. I'm uh, about two solid days from finishing the second Vicks book and sending it off to the publisher. So the Vicks days are not behind me. Uh, my best Vicks days are actually in front of me because I'm – not restrained by a compliance department or anything like that anymore. <laughs> How about uh, Dr. Lean Hogs? How's that, how's that sound? Dr. Dr. Lean Hogs? No, I want to be Dr. You know, last time I was on, we were talking cheese. I want to be Dr. Cheese. Ooh, Dr. Cheese. That has a certain ring to I it. Like I, it. 
I think with our neighbors to the north here in Wisconsin, that might that might develop a certain cult following. What do you think? Actually, the cheese doctor. The cheese That's doctor. That's even better. <laughs> I like it. Don't start going down this path if you're, especially if you're if you've been playing the how much cold medicine uh, can you drink contest. Yeah, I'm heading down a dark path in that regard. Yeah. I'll. I'll pick it up. I'll pick it up for you, and I won't throw too many curveballs out today. <laughs> there that? you go. I'll, I'll, be just, nice. I'll just let you talk okay. for an hour. Uh, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm getting there when it comes to when it, I could feel it coming on. So it's a good thing I think we have a, a nice little holiday induced hiatus next week because I don't know, but this time next week if I'll even have a voice. But we shall see. Before we get to those dark days, listeners, let's kick things off with uh, what the heck is going on? What is moving and shaking over there in the land of CME? Remember, you guys can play along. The home game, as always, cmegroup.com slash twifo, T-W-I-F-O. You type that in, you can find all this good stuff like we're looking at right now. What's moving and shaking for the week? Remember, set that market date scan to a week so you can see the full week. And let's see what's moving. So, Mr. Rhodes, as I like to ask our guests, I give you guys the choice. Should we start dark side or light side, upside or downside this week, sir? Uh, let's start dark side. I'm just, I'm feeling dark today. I like it. I like it. You know, Sean's always in here. He's the, uh, he's the perma bull. He's always talking upside. It's nice to get a little bit of, a little bit of dark side here. Let's go to the bottom here. Let's see if Dr. Cheese will be excited this week. <laughs> Number five to the bottom, which I guess is where you want to be. If you got to be in the bottom five, you want to be at the, at the, at the top of the bottom five, not the bottom, which is the worst loser. So I guess the bottom of the bottom, I guess that would be really sick. It's number five. It's feeder cattle. Off a mere three quarters of a percentage point this week. And then numero quattro here, we've got corn, good old corn, off a little over a percentage point, one and a third percent. Then number three, soybeans, get a little bit of ag love here, uh, off about one and a half percent. Not ag love for price move, but maybe some ag love on the show here today, off one and a half percent. Uh, numero dose here, our old friend Nat Gas making a return to the bottom five, this time off nearly four percent on the week. And number one with a bullet to the dark side. Lean hogs. I was just joking about Dr. Hogs, but uh, maybe maybe we need a Dr. Lean Hogs on the show today. Off eight and a quarter percent. Not exactly good times for Lean Hog. I do believe there are some uh, reports coming out on the cattle and livestock front today, which is probably driving a lot of this a lot of this movement. And then to the upside, we've got number five, our old friend WTI, back in the top five, up about two and a third percent. Number four, Iron Ore. A name we talked about before, you've asked us about before, not really a big option story, but it's, it persists in the top five at number four with up nearly 3% this week, 2.95% to be precise. Numero trace here, we got rough rice up three and a quarter percent. Number two here, platinum up a little over 4%, 4.1% to be precise. And number one with the bullet this week, Arbob, Arbob gas up about 4.6%. So there you go. That's what's the big upside and downside movers this week over there in CME Group. Mr. Rhodes, as always, I turn to you, sir, to direct my queries. Where should we begin our journey this week? Could be one of these big movers, could be something else. What, what are you feeling to start the show this week, sir? Interest rates. <laughs> Let's talk about interest rates. <laughs> How did I know you were going to go there? I love interest rates. Actually, um, well, you go ahead, and then uh, something, something cool is happening in the interest rate space. Where, you want, I'm assuming you want to start in euro dollars. Is that what you're saying by rates, or you want to start somewhere that's else? A, that's a big one. Yeah, that one in the tenure. I happen to have euro dollars up on my screen, so let, let's start there. Uh huh. But and while I'm pulling up the data, why don't you regale us with what's catching your eye in euro dollars this week? Sir? Well, it, 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 that FedWatch tool. Uh, some things have been changing. When we came out of the meeting uh, about a week or so ago, the uh, it looked like everything was just fifty fifty across the board, and now. Uh, it looks like uh, they're, they're, the market is expecting some sort of a, a potential uh, rate cut in September of next year. We, we've kind of started shifting again. And when we, when we start to get swifty, uh, that, that can spur some extra option activity as well. Well, I happen to have it up right here at the Fed Watch here. And look, in the next meeting, obviously, is in December. Listeners, that's in 19 days. Market pricing a whole heck of a lot of nothing in there, 93.5% saying we're pretty much staying where we are. Then we go out to Jan. You can click all this yourself, listeners. Go on that top tab for uh, the target meeting. You can see, you'll see Jan also looking like pretty much they're factoring in that it's going to stay about 80% probability that we're going to stay where we are right now. Then we get out to March, and it's a little bit less, 73%, with about a 20% chance of a, a 25 basis point cut. So 
That's kind of interesting. Only a 5% chance for a 25 basis point raise. We go out to April. Let's see. Uh, a two, now it drops off more. Two-thirds saying we're staying where we are. And about a third saying we may make cut. So it's, it's growing as we get out there, listeners. And let's go out. Let's go all the way out to June just for fun. Uh, let's see. A fifth, then, it's, then it's 50% saying we're staying where we are. And about, getting, yeah, it's getting more. A little more than a third saying a get, quarter. It's getting pity pity. Yeah, and then about almost 10% saying a half, uh, a half a point, which would be, um, that would be aggressive. Uh, let's hope not. <laughs> And then let's go July really quickly. Forty-five uh, percent now saying where we are. Thirty-seven percent, so more than two-thirds saying a quarter basis point cut, and over twelve percent saying a half, a half, a half. I keep saying quarter basis point, 20, twenty-five basis point point. Obviously not a quarter basis point. And then uh, again, that cold mass and kick it in. Let's go out to September where you were talking, Mister Rhodes, and you're right. Yeah, it's fifty-fifty. Yeah. Well, not fifty percent equal, but fifty-fifty from the total. Equal probability. It's almost exactly the same. It's thirty eight point six percent saying we're staying where we are, and thirty eight point five percent saying we're going to cut a quarter basis point and a quarter yeah, twenty five basis points, and then about sixteen percent saying off half a basis, half a yep. half a point. So yeah, wow, impressive do, stuff. Do you want to be a conspiracy theorist? Sure, go for it. Uh, yeah, this is the last meeting before the next election. Are you saying the Fed somehow correlates this uncorrelated body that pays no pays no mind to politics is somehow going to have some? No, it's the market. This is the market assuming that uh, something happens. I think it's kind of funny that uh, you know typically uh, the the traditionally uh, the Fed, unless they really got to do something, will not do anything leading up to uh, you know a presidential election. And I just find it kind of funny that. Uh, we're we're hovering around fifty fifty forever, and then lo and behold, we hit that meeting right before the election, and and it's basically saying we got a little over a sixty one percent chance that we'll get a cut by then. That's I, I just I find that funny. I, you know, the, I know a lot of conspiracy theorists think that uh, Trump calls a few of his friends and then he tweets so they can make money off of shorting futures, on long futures, or whatever. I uh, yeah, the conspiracy theorists could say, oh, well, they know that Trump's going to make them cut rates in September. So we better start positioning ourselves. And that's what's showing up on this FedWatch tool. I know that is a huge stretch, even for somebody on cough medicine. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. You know, they are supposedly uncorrelated. Yet you're right. They don't tend to do a lot, usually ahead of elections. And that it's, it's amazing how I don't think you've ever seen the Fed hike rates Right before they need to uh, to appoint and confirm a new a new Fed chairperson, isn't it funny how that works, sir? Oh yeah, no, it's all kinds of uh, funniness going on. It, it, it's all different this time compared to what it used to be like. Can you imagine if a Fed chairman said, "Hey, eyes raise rates. I dare you to confirm me now." <laughs> just 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 raising <laughs> in the, the face job. of all opposition. That would be fun. Yeah, that's pretty good. Now, since you made me look out here at rates, let's go to the euro dollars here because this is the beast. This is the number one with a bullet again here, listeners. Coming into showtime, we are seeing the lion's share of the paper, which is only 20.5%. That shows how much how broad the paper is here. Coming in the March 2020 contract out here with 20.5%. That looks like that future is at about a 98.31 or so out there in, uh, on this side here. And it looks like the Lion's share, actually the number one with the bullet, the big print for the week out here, 151000 That's pretty light for Euro dollars, where we talked a quarter of a million at a clip, no problem. A paltry, a mere, a meager, 151000 of the 98 quarter puts in March, lighting up the tape this week, listeners. with Let's see, the lion's share of that paper coming on Monday, 101000 of that, 151000 coming on Monday, so two-thirds of it coming on Monday. Not a heck of a lot lighting it up out there today on these bad boys, a whopping zero, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. And of all of that, pretty much opening, 92,000 of that opening this week. So a lot of opening paper on these 98 quarter puts here in March. Let's look really quickly at the SKU. SKU is not really, not typically a huge story, and your dollar doesn't move that much, but it seems like it's moving a little bit this week here. We got the puts were 18.3% cheap. To the at the money last week, this week, they're coming in a little bit. They're 17.1%. So getting a little bit of a bid out there. And then the calls were 17% rich. So that's where the bias was. And it seems like this week they are even more biased. They are now 20% rich. So the calls ticking up, puts coming in, 
as we're seeing a little bit of a vol, li- actually pretty aggressive vol lift here. Looks like a 10 handles in this contract, which is a lot. <laughs> the half the money vol is now 43 and pretty much two thirds out there, up about 10 and a quarter points from where it was last week. So that could probably explain a lot of this movement in the skew is just a, a lot of vol surging back into the Euro dollars. Mr. Rhodes, uh, as our as our resident rates aficionado, what's catching your eye out here this week, sir? Uh, you know, it's just, it, it's amazing to me how quickly the market adjusts based on that farther out forecast. You know, and it happens very, very quickly. It's like we go from um, a, a certain, we don't, you know, in the equity world, it seems like we drift from one assumption to another. Uh, it seems like in the in the rates world, we just shift quickly from one uh, assumption to another. That things just change kind of on a dime. It happened uh, last May, June, or whenever they started to indicate that we were going to start seeing some uh, rate cuts. And uh, I, I think that's actually why you have such low implied volatility when you look at the uh, euro dollar options or most of the interest rate complex options compared to like equity options because the the changes happen very quick and there's not a whole lot of volatility to the uh, changes in attitude. Uh, speaking of changes in attitude, a lot of interesting changes in attitude going on out there in uh, in the energy space. Now, we've been talking mostly nat gas of late. Haven't touched a lot, really, on our old friend WTI. We kind of have to touch on it this week. You want conspiracy theories, sir. They are aplenty <laughs> in the crude space Right now, I mentioned crude in the bottom of our top five this week. WTI up about two and a third percent on the week. Let's get us giving some of that back now, up about one and a third percent net on the week. Coming in right now, that front future at about a 58.60 out there or so, which is still up quite a bit. Of course, we had a bit of a rally yesterday as we saw crude supplies rising a little bit less than expected. Numbers coming out of the EIA and others. You know, remember, this has been this. Long-term push-pull between global macro demand and domestic supply here. And if supply is a little bit less than expected, a little bit of a bullish story there. Also seeing a lot of interesting things going up. A lot of people are terming this a bit of Saudi theater. Of course, they have finally, after much hemming and hawing, much anticipation, have finally announced an IPO for that Saudi Aramco. So a lot of people are thinking Saudis are working to bolster a little bit of the crude behind the scenes ahead of this IPO. There already are. There's already some "quote unquote" leaks floating around that these cuts that they have in place right now will be extended until June. Nothing official out of OPEC, of course, or the Saudis, but a lot of leaks swirling around. A lot of people thinking this is the Saudis acting behind the scenes to keep bolstering the price of crude ahead of their IPO. So, of course, moving up today again as well. That's combining for. A decent week out here for WTI. Speaking of which, before we get into all the mechanics of what's going on out there from WTI Options Week, Mr. Rhodes, our old friend, Mr. Blue Putnam, the uh, chief economist over there in CME land, putting out an interesting research piece. Not, not, not Blue's usual stomping grounds of some of the, uh, the political theater of, of the Saudi oil space, but that's kind of what he's writing about right now with this IPO and how he thinks, and particularly for our concerns, how it's going to impact the trading environment of crude oil. He says that this IPO, this forthcoming IPO, is really going to change the dynamics of the space, in particular volatility. I encourage you again to read it for yourselves. It's called just very easily how Aramco IPO will change oil dynamics. Head on over to semigroup.com. You'll, you'll find it. It's right there on the homepage. And he writes here that, of course, they're preparing for their IPO, and this is going to maybe shift them away from their previous role of really managing managing global uh, global crude supplies and looking at all that and maybe shift them toward instead focusing on managing their position in the company in terms of shares. And he writes here, you know, in the past, uh, Saudis have always been the swing producer for OPEC. When we need to kick in a little more or cut back a little more, the Saudis are always the ones who can do that and make the OPEC, whatever they want to have happen, happen. And that worked pretty well. You know, obviously a few decades ago, back in the 70s into the 80s, not so much these days, of course, the much ballyhooed plan by the OPEC and the Saudis to drive down crude to really squeeze the shale producers didn't really work out the way they planned. So a lot of folks thinking maybe this is Saudi now shifting away from being that, that quote-unquote swing producer and very importantly, a buffer to a lot of crude volatility. Uh, now instead they may shift away from that, exerting perhaps less influence over overall oil production 
and instead move towards effectively buying and selling shares in their own Aramco. So they need to fund something domestically. They're just going to dump more shares <laughs> as opposed to cranking up production or vice versa. So according to Blue, he thinks this will lead to a, a market, perhaps dramatic increase in oil volatility going forward as the Saudis kind of step back from that side of the business and instead focus on managing their sizable holdings in Saudi Aramco. What do you think, Mr. Rhodes? As far as conspiracies go, there's a couple of foot here. We have, of course, the projected Saudi theater of them perhaps manipulating prices ahead of their IPO. And then, of course, Blue's contention here that the Saudis may be shifting their focus towards the IPO and away from being this swing producer may indeed lead to more crude volatility going forward. I know you're a big analyst and researcher of crude volatility. Are you buying what Blue and maybe some of the rest of the market is selling here? I love Blue. I really do. But um, I'm going to poke a little bit of a hole in the, the argument that he, that he put out here, which is that they will be managing their holdings of Aramco shares and when they need money. What he's really saying is when they need money, uh, they'll sell more shares of Aramco. Um, the, the, when, when you have a seller, you got to have a buyer. And I don't think there's a really huge appetite among uh, a lot of institutional investors to go out and buy shares on Aramco. That there really is this belief that uh, the Saudis are, are, are trying to sell their comp- start selling their company off at the top, much like uh, buying an IPO in a ride-sharing program where it's really just the VCs trying to cash in as quickly as they possibly can. Um, so I, 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 I do think, I, I agree with half the argument. I agree that it's going to be more difficult for Saudi Arabia to uh, turn the spigot on, turn it off, and, and not worry about having to manage from quarter to quarter uh, because they do have some shareholder interests out there now. Um, but I don't know if uh, when, when, the, when, the, when the kingdom needs more money, if they're going to be able to turn around and sell shares. And then the other part, as I read through this, and I read through it again this morning, uh, knowing we were going to talk about it, I kept waiting for, okay, if they're not going to be the, uh, the, the balancing act, uh, who is? Who, who's going to take their – somebody's going to have to take their place uh, because, you know, um, OPEC's going to have to maybe have a go-to guy – as far as the one that really does uh, you know, play by the rules and, and takes down production a little bit or increases production based on whatever their outcome they're, they're trying to come up with, uh, if they're not going to have anybody, if they're not going to have anybody take that role over, uh, does that mean that you know we just get rid of OPEC altogether? It's uh, you know we don't focus on it like we used to. That's for sure. I think he's kind of a, he's kind of acknowledging that the, the dominant yeah. position is the shale producers here in the U.S. and that's going to be. He's saying it's going to be more market-driven and much more of a state of flux than a, instead of having this, you know, this guiding hand of the parental Saudis there always easing things. Yeah. So you, uh, we, you've got an OPEC watch tool as well, uh, which, I've always, which, which I haven't spent nearly as much time with as I'd like to. Uh, but the OPEC meeting watch, they've only got uh, an outlook through the December 6th meeting, and right now it's they're, it's leaning toward doing nothing, maintaining uh, output, uh, about a 60% shot. That's what they're going to do. 35% shot, they will uh, cut a little bit or maybe announce they're cutting. I guess there's a difference between what they do and what they announce uh, that they're going to do. Uh, but it be interesting to take the historical data from that one and see if there's any change once Saudi Arabia becomes more, uh, more shareholder-friendly. The shareholder-friendly kingdom. <laughs> the shareholder-friendly Saudis. That would be interesting. Interesting uh, you know, comment there, too. You don't think the Saudis can – they swing a pretty big stick. You don't think they could shake that stick around and get some of the institutions to come in and take down some size for them. You think that's not the case, huh? I think uh, I, 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 it'll be interesting to see who the, uh, the big institutional holders are after it comes out. I uh, would not be the least bit surprised to see uh, a handful of sovereign funds. You know, countries that want to keep them happy. Yeah, have a little bit of vested interest in 
and keeping them happy. Let's see if crude is keeping us happy this week. Price action might be for the crude bulls out there. In terms of volatility, not so much coming off a bit out here in WTI. About a point to a point and a half, depending on kind of where you're looking. Uh, close to two points if you get all the way out to the to the middle of next year. In terms of where the action was this week, about 55% coming in Jan. Remember, uh, Deese kind of pretty much rolling off the board here this week, except for some of the weeklies. Uh, listeners, so it's all Jan all the time, 55% this week. And the big print out here in crude oil this week in WTI were, wasn't Jan, so that's appropriately enough. To Jan 60s, 16,351 of these bad boys lighting it up. The lion's share coming on Tuesday and Wednesday, 5,600 and 5,400 respectively. Back and forth on this strike as we're seeing only about 3,000 openings, so I guess that makes sense as we're rallying towards that 60 strike, starting to threaten it. We're seeing back and forth paper out there. People like their round numbers. And a lot of products and and crude is no different. We see a lot of liquidity aggregating around these even money strikes. And they're very close. Number two are the 50 puts, which is kind of interesting because we have rallied a firm way away from the 50 handle. Also in Jan, nearly 16,000, so only a few hundred contracts Separating these two, 15,976 to be precise. The lion's share coming on Tuesday, nearly 9,000. The rest kind of spread throughout the week. And again, a lot of back and forth trading, only about 2,400 of that opening. So back and forth on the 50 puts and the 60 calls. One of those makes more sense, I think, than perhaps the other. Opening position on downside puts. Maybe some folks not buying what the Saudis are selling out here in this near-term rally, thinking maybe it's a little bit overdone. Or perhaps drawing some aggressive lines, or maybe not that aggressive right now, lines in the sand out there in WTI. And then we've also got some action here on the double puts. Those make a little bit more sense. Those have about 13500 to the lion's share coming on Monday, nearly 5000 and the rest kind of scattered throughout the week, and only slightly biased towards opening. So back and forth paper across the board. Doesn't seem to line up, so there's a ton of related papers up for today. Maybe some verticals going up today. Looks like maybe some ratios. Kind of hard to tell in a cursory glance out here. Really quickly, too, looking at the skew out in Jan, which has about 58 days to go here, so nearly two months. We, the puts were 7.7% rich to the at the money. This week, they are 8.5% rich. So all that put paper, probably a lot of buying out there, giving these puts a little bit more of a lift. Not a ton, though, not quite a point, so... Could be some shift in there as well. Also, you've got the calls. We're cheap, nearly 4% cheap this week. They are even cheaper, 6.5% cheap. So not a lot of love for calls. Getting a little bit more love for puts. Some folks out there, even though crude is rallying, WITI is rallying, maybe maybe fading what we're seeing out here. Is that your take as well, Mr. Rhodes? And Anything else catching your eye out here from a WTI vol or paper perspective this week? I could be using the, the relatively cheap put options to hedge themselves a little bit going into next year because – uh, we may not be completely out of the woods as far as the potential global recession goes, and oil is something that would definitely get hit if, if that were to come true. So that might explain some of the put activity, not necessarily betting it's going to happen, but hoping it isn't going to happen. All right, since we're, we already hit on crude, we hit on your much bemoaned rates. Whenever you're on here, you oh, you don't talk enough rates. So there we go. We gave you a little flavor of rates. Another product category – that doesn't get a lot of love on the show, but folks write in all the time. How, how you down for a little bit of ags today, sir? Oh, yeah. Now, let's love do it. Ag. Let's do it. I mentioned there were a lot of ags in the movers and shakers this week. We had, to the downside, we had soybeans and corn, three and four here on the bottom five with 1.5% and 1.3% respectively. On the upside, we had good old rough rice up about three and a quarter out there. So ags were moving. It seemed like there was a lot of action out here in corn this week so let's let's put our our love there a lot of our listeners i know are big on the corn i think we have another listener comment about corn again today so if the corn love continues out there in our audience and never let it be said that we don't listen to our listeners here uh interesting stuff going on out here we've seen some back and forth going on in corn of course the ag is obviously very impacted by this 
Will they, won't they dance with the trade war? Beans, maybe a little bit more than corn, but corn also feeling that impact. Of course, weather, obviously a big driver out there as well. We've seen weak demand for corn, global demand with this concern over, over the trade war. Hasn't really been a strong, strong argument for strong global demand for corn, so that's been weighing on it. Uh, we've also seen, though, these prices now are making, we're at 370 now coming into showtime here on that front, uh, front future. This, this decent amount below the 400 level now has got people thinking maybe our prices have sold enough. Maybe it's a bit oversold, starting to get a level where maybe we could see a little bit of a bounce. Didn't see that materialize yet this week in terms of pricing, but maybe that will continue going forward. We also did have a, a cattle on feed report coming out of the USDA today, probably why a lot of those livestock names are moving this week as well. That's usually, usually a bullish indicator for the corn market, but it didn't seem like – it, it looks like it maybe mitigated some of the losses a little bit here. Corn's only off about three-quarters of a percent now coming into the second half of the show here. But it looks like you need a little bit more before uh, all these oversold people start turning towards the, uh, turning towards the green and bidding up themselves uh, some corn. Let's see where the action was out here this week. Yeah, it was out here in the Dece contract that has a whopping <laughs> one day to go here. So it's kind of hard to parse skew and vol in effectively a daily contract. But 38% of the paper was coming out in here, particularly the action was in these 370 puts. That's where the lion's share of the business was this week. Twenty, Nearly 21,000 contracts, number one with a bullet out here. Again, these are pretty much at the money puts, so no surprise this is where the action was. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, twenty-one thousand almost going up. Uh, the lion's share came on Monday, about seventy-three hundred. Tuesday had about sixty-six hundred. Wednesday, four thousand. And a paltry twenty-six hundred going up today. Pretty much all of that every day was biased towards the closing. So, not surprising. You got a contract that's going out today or <laughs> within a day. Pretty much uh, it's a lot of closing paper coming out there. That makes a lot of sense. That's probably why we're seeing number one with a bullet out there. People closing out, uh, closing out now at the money puts. With about a day to go. Right behind that, let's see what some of the other actionable paper was here. Also, we've got the 365 puts going up about 14,000 times this week. The big day was Monday as well with about 4,600. Also biased towards the closing, but only slightly there. So it looks like a little more back and forth on those 365 puts, which makes sense. They aren't the at the money strike, so you're not going to see as much tumult there as you would expect. You know, we can't really can't parse the skew in a contract that has a day to go. That's just... That way lies madness. So let's go out instead to another month that had um, another contract that had decent paper. Let's go out to the Jan contract. It had about 17, nearly 18% of the paper this week. The big print out there was a 390 calls going up 7,900 times. We can look at skew a little bit more meaningfully out there. We're seeing uh, the puts were 4.5% cheap to the at the money. Last week, this week, they've come in. Now they're about 1.2% cheap. So get a little bit of a bid. In the puts, the calls were where the action was last week, 7.2% rich to the at the money. So nice love for the calls. This week, seems like a lot of that has gone away. Only about 2.8% bid to the at the money this week. So calls coming in, puts getting a bid. Not surprising because we're still seeing this sell-off continue out here. Maybe some people were hoping this report might turn things around. And maybe when that didn't happen, they're, they're getting the heck out of Dodge there to the upside. Either way... Interesting stuff afoot out here in corn. Mr. Rhodes, how often do the ags make it across your, your tab group research these days? They make it across my research a lot, especially with some of the things that have been going on this year. Um, looking at all the different silos like you do, the different complexes, uh, we, we like to focus in on uh, you know, where the action is from quarter to quarter and month to month, and really the the only contracts that have shown some decent and consistent volume growth this year outside of interest rates have, has been either gold for the most part, but definitely corn. Uh, corn volume was up like on a year-over-year basis over 50% back in October. So no wonder people are asking about it. People are trading it. Um, and, and really, outside, outside of interest rates, that's uh, really about the only area that we're seeing a lot more interest. I guess you can thank trade wars and, and other things like that. And funky weather, I guess, doesn't help too much or doesn't hurt too much either. 
It does not, sir. So there's a little bit of your flavor of ags there, listeners. We also got to touch on some small caps. It is appropriate, Mr. Russell Rhodes, that you are in the Russell hot seat today. How does that sound? I think we're talking about RVX versus Vic. Yes, is Russell? Can Russell talk some Russell today? Are you up for it, sir? I can always talk some Russell. All right, let's come into showtime here. Let's see what's lighting it up out here in the small cap side of the space here. The Russell 2000 off, not a ton, off about two thirds of a percentage point, right about that 1586, almost 1587 level. We talked before on the show. Uh, we had Rick Rosenthal as well as Sean on the show last week going a deep dive into all things small cap. And it does seem like the Russell 2000 has, for whatever reason, has this, this resistance up there at 1600. Can't seem to really break through it to any appreciable degree. Whenever it gets close to it, it sells off. We're on that sell-off portion again here this week. Can't really make it happen out here. The, let's see where the action was this week. The big, the big month was, the big contract was in Dece with the 1420 puts. So, Again, kind of what we expect out here right now is pretty far out of the money puts tend to lead the dance out here on these uh, on these FTSE Russell options here on CME Group. But different story if you start looking at some of the other ones, maybe the IWMs or the Ruts, different flows out there. But the ones going up on CME right now, it seems like it's pretty far out of the money puts leading the dance out here all the time. Vol creeping up here, up about three quarters of a percent of a point, three quarters of a point, I should say. Out here, three quarters of a percent out here in yeah, about 1475. So let's look here. Uh, we're seeing RVX though, which in getting near that's that's in the farther off contracts that's out there into into beginning of next year, about 14 and a half. Near duration contracts a little bit frothier. In fact, strangely enough, for like the second or third week in a row now, we're seeing RVX coming at the showtime almost. Almost exactly unched. It was a 1675 last week. It is a 1674 this week. Meanwhile, VIX continues to move all over the place, even though this week, coming into the start of the show, VIX, its cash itself, was almost exactly unched as well. Very infrequently can we say that. VIX cash was at about a 1375. It has come off a little bit since then, I believe, but still, uh, it was at about 1375. So that was unched, and RVX was unched, which put that spread at about exactly a three which itself was unched. So a lot of weird business afoot. Mr. Rhodes, anything catching your eye from a small cap volatility perspective this week, sir? I think we are in a perfectly competitive market. We have finally found all types of equilibrium, and therefore things are not changed. And I do know how to make volatility go down. You start talking on this show, and volatility has come in, sir. No, all i got to do is predict that VIX is going to be at 19 next week, and it'll go to 10. That'll do a little bit of contrarian. No, no, no. You know how poorly I used to guess on the <laughs> other show. That's all. I'm trying to make, I was trying to beat you to making fun of myself. Said the cold medicine is keeping keeping you. I would never uh, do not, such a thing. Not so. on your toe. Oh, I. Oh. I would never. I would never mock or malign a guest on so, my network. How dare no, you? It's um. You know, we're kind of coming into the end of the year. And don't you think people are pretty darn happy, uh, especially in the S and P 500, with what they've gotten for the year? Uh, they may, you know, be sitting sitting on their hands and waiting for next year and trying to figure out how they're going to put up decent 2020 numbers. But I don't think there are many people that would have told you that they thought they were going to make 20% in the equity market in 2019 coming into the year. Not with all the, you know, we were going into a recession, as far as everybody knew. Uh, and and I think a lot of people felt like the best thing that was going to happen was maybe a 5% year on the S&P 500, and same thing on the small cap stocks. But I, I think maybe we're just kind of at a resting point. We're past, we're past whatever the Fed's going to do. Uh, it's too early to worry about the election. We got past third quarter earnings relatively unscathed. Uh, it's time to enjoy the holidays. Yeah, you know, I was talking to someone recently, and they were in the process of trying to launch a new fund, and it, saying it's very challenging right now because everyone looks like a genius out there right now. You just buy the S and P, buy the Russell, buy whatever the hell you want, and it's just shooting straight to the moon. So who needs who needs advanced risk management and everything else when you can just buy and hold? And so these that's the kind of market we find ourselves in these days, listeners. Mister Rose, I think we got we got time for one more complex. I think before we bring on the the hordes of unwashed masses that are the listeners. I tease, of course. Uh, so where should we hang our hat last before we do some listener questions? 
Um, I guess we could do medals real quick, although not a whole lot's been going on. I mean, it's, let's do medals. All right, medals. <laughs> medals it is. You sound very mm-hmm. convinced. So <laughs> I know. Well, you know, not, it wasn't my first choice. <laughs> you can have your first choice. Wait, I'm not stopping you. You can choose whatever you want. Listeners who get mad at me, I don't choose your complex. You blame Russell. He's not choosing whatever yeah, it is you want. Me. He's I'm, not choosing I, it. I, I'm choosing medals last for the kickball team. There we go. Yes, medals is the redheaded stepchild out here. We did see some movement in Palladium, like I said, in the uh, in the top five here. Or something, Platinum. It was up 4.1%, but I think we all know Platinum, not really a big... Options story. If you want me to prove it again, listeners, let's pull it up right now, shall we? CMEgroup.com slash Twifo. Go to that drop down. Go to medals. Pull up platinum. We got a wash. Well, not, a, not a bad week this week. About 1,033 contracts going up in platinum. Platinum is, uh, let's see, looks like giving back a little bit of those gains now, but up about 2.5% right now. And the big print out here, we're at about a 9, right around that 920 strike. And the at the money was the 900 puts. Doing a whopping 600 this week. That's the number one trade with a bullet out here in platinum. So all those asking, where, whither the platinum? There you go. Not a lot going on on the platinum front. Instead, let's turn our attention to the shiny stuff, a.k.a. gold. You know, it's, uh, it's forgotten stepchild. Silver has been moving quite a bit of late this week. Not so much. So let's, let's turn towards the gold and see what's going on out here. Of course, Gold's been interesting to watch and all this flight to quality in the equity markets and then perhaps not so much. Gold's been moving a wee little bit. Of course, a lot of people thinking maybe this will-they-won't-they they dance of the trade war. Market's getting a little bit fatigued of that now. Maybe gold is as well. But coming into showtime, we're off a quarter of a percent on the week, down about five handles. Puts us right around that 1465 strike for the at the money. Let's see. Number one with a bullet out here in terms of the action was in Dece, which goes away in about four days, listeners. So... All the action in the weeklies here. 1,500 calls were doing the lion's share of the business. 7,000 of those going up this week. And then, again, those are pretty far out the money at this point. So that 1,500 level seems like it's in the rearview mirror a little bit, at least for the time being. Uh, let's see. The lion's share going up that 7,000 coming on Wednesday, 2,300. 1,800 on Tuesday and 1,500 today. Let's see what else is going on. You know, again, it can't parse skew. Uh, Bow, by the way, is kind of a mixed bag. Off, but off slightly here in uh, in gold. Let's look to skew. Let's go to the number two month. Let's see if we can find something a little bit more palatable. You know, it's, once you get beyond nearly 40% going up in that D's contract list, and once you get beyond that, it's not a heck of a lot. You have to go all the way out here. How's it jammed a decent amount? 17.5% of the paper. So I guess we'll have to be content with that. And out of here, the skew was, let's see, all calls all the time last week, even more so this week. We have the puts were about 3.5% cheap to the at the money this week, 5.6% cheap. So puts getting cheaper, even though we continue to sell off, which is kind of interesting. And the calls were nearly 8% risk to the at the money this week. They're over 12%, 12.3%. So upside calls here in Jan continuing to get a lift, and that's probably – Something to do with the fact that the 1500s were also the big trade out here in Jan. So as you said before, paper loves a round number, and that's very much the case in gold. You know, it was 1400 and 1300. Now 1500 is the is the strike everyone's kind of glued to. Will we break it? Will we stay north of it? So not surprising that a lot of the paper is coming on that side of the fence with about the big print coming on Tuesday. 2,000 of them going up on Tuesday, and the rest kind of scattered throughout the week, slightly closing, actually. So some closing action on the 1500s in Jan. Interesting stuff, Mr. Rose. I'm sure a lot of your research clientele over there in Tabland like themselves some gold. What's on your radar here from a gold trading and volatility perspective these days? Sir? Well, I mean, and as it should, what you, what you just said with respect to gold skew, kind of uh, even though the price is coming down, it's it, it, it's not really doing a whole lot on the put side. It's, it's more, it looks like it's a little bit more concerned to the call side. If you think about the environment that we're in right now, uh, probably it, it, you're going to start seeing, uh, you know, concerns for 2020. And I would not be the least bit surprised to see people being a little bit concerned about uh, potential inflation going into next year. That's something that would get gold going. Uh, probably more concerned about something like that than uh, a global recession, which would put more pressure on the price of gold. 
and probably would not be as much of a jump event as some sort of big old inflation surprise. So I think that 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 kind of macro thinking is showing up in the option pricing, which is exactly what you want. Uh, if, so it, it kind of reflects, I think, what would be common thinking right now. Let's see if our listeners have some common thinking or perhaps some uncommon thinking. Let's hope as we keep on rolling into your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, let's get to it. See what you guys have on the brain. Let's start with <laughs> RC out. He just says corn, baby, with some exclamation points. <laughs> well, we're with you. We like corn, too. We, do, we definitely have a growing cadre of the listening audience who likes themselves some corn. So hopefully there, Mr. and Mrs. RC out. You liked our little foray into corn Let us know if you want to hear more. Maybe you want to hear something different about corn. You know, there's a lot to parse out there. Uh, Maybe as you see the warm, maybe start turning out there. That'll be an interesting story uh, to parse here on the show. And certainly as it keeps moving, we'll definitely have it on our radar. Again, you know, we have only a certain amount of time and a lot of complexes to parse. So it doesn't always make it onto the show. But hopefully, Mr. and Mrs. RC out, you got your corn baby fix on the show. (laughs) I like that. Corn baby! Exclamation point. What more could possibly be said about corn. Let's go to EKG3, maybe a doctor, cardiologist maybe. Who knows? They want to know what are some of the biggest futures options markets outside of the U.S. Ah, yes, an interesting interesting topic. You know who does some great research on this, Mr. Rhodes? And I'm going to pull it up as I toss to you so I can look for it. Our friends over there at the FIA, the Futures Industry Association, They do a great survey every year of global derivatives markets, and there's a lot of interesting hot spots out there. Obviously, there's some some bright spot products like the Kospi over there in Korea, which does a ton of paper, but it's a very small contract. And they got weird things like Shanghai Rebar, I think, which is more of a futures story. I don't think it's a big options story, but I want to check on that. So there's some interesting hot spots out there. Mr. Rose, anything come across your, your tape as I start digging into this research, sir? No, I do this. I, I, I actually am just finishing up the Futures Quarterly Report, and that will basically go out, I think, Monday next week on a very busy Thanksgiving week. Uh, but one of the things that I do is I take a look at uh, what, you know, again, the different silos. And there's a lot – trading around the world is very different in the futures and options on futures market than it is in the U.S. Uh, you know, we're very interest rate-oriented. Uh, the rest of the world is not. Uh, in fact, the biggest area is uh, the equity space, uh, followed by current, followed closely by currency and metals. Uh, and currency, we didn't even talk about currency today because it's so small with respect to the uh, options on futures. It's, it, it, I, which I'm amazed at because I think it'd be a, it's a it's a really great market to trade. Uh, I think maybe in the U.S. we have so many. Uh, opportunities for retail to trade spot currency that they go that direction instead of trading the derivatives that's the only thing i can come up with respect with respect to that uh but like you mentioned the cosby and uh the nifty 50 and a few other markets there are some huge equity markets and in fact uh the equity futures volume outside of the u.s it looks like it's going to be up about 30 percent this year uh, it, it, we're looking like a huge year in that space. Uh, same thing with metals. Uh, currency is going to be relatively flat. Energy is actually getting a boost, even though it's going to be down year over year here. Uh, it's going to be much higher around the world. And even the ags are going to see a bump of about 25% or so on vo- volume-wise year over year. Um, so that 
the distribution of volume is very different around the world than it is um, within the U.S. And it varies from specific market to specific market as well. It does. I'm just trying to. Uh, there's a lot of. There's a large volume of data here <laughs> on terms of which products are lighting it up and where things are hot. Listeners, uh, obviously, Euro dollars is still the the king of the heap. That's up there. This is just. Oh, this is just for rates, though. This is just for rates and rates related products. I need all of it. Oh, FIA, what are you doing to me? Uh, but <laughs> still, Euro dollars is a big dog. No matter how you're breaking it down here, that's that's a big one. Also, it seems like some of their global trends over here. Uh, you saw good, strong growth. This is these are numbers from July. So this covers the first half of 2019. If you want to find it for yourself, listeners, FIA.org, a good place to go. They have the uh, the breakdowns of the top contracts which I'm looking at right now. But uh, this is not. I have to see. They have it by complex. So let's go out here. Number one in the ags is uh, soybean meal futures on the Dalian Commodity Exchange. Again, this is futures. Uh, again, notably, futures are going to outpace options, actually, but not as much as you might think. Uh, futures volume, first half of the year is 9.3 billion contracts. Options, 7.3 billion. So the options catching up out there, even though certain parts of the world still very much like themselves a little bit of futures. Equity index volume is also growing uh, across the board. That's, that's pretty much the fastest growing sector this year, up 23% in the first half of the year. That's futures and the options. And rates kind of unched from last year, so not a lot, not a lot of dancing in the rates. Uh, precious metals, uh, they saw the biggest decline. Go figure, the trade war kind of weighing on a lot of the stuff uh, out there. And, uh, yeah, some, some hot spots uh, the NSC, the National Stock Exchange out of India, doing a lot of growth in their equity options out there as well, equity index options. Uh, so that's probably a hot spot out there. I think Shanghai Rebar and, of course, uh, let's see really quick. Let's go to energy. Let's see hot contracts out here beyond. There we go. Give me that, of course. Okay, so Brent out there actually on the Moscow Exchange followed by the light sweet crude oil. Again, this is all futures here primarily. Uh, they got the Nifty does a lot out of the – obviously, I just mentioned out of India. That's a hot product out there. Also, Bovespa coming out of uh, Brazil out there, pretty active as well from an equity index perspective. Let's look to FX. Uh, it's going to be uh, dollar rupee. Again, this, a lot of this is contract volume, so it could be some funky contract specs at work out there as well. Again, Steel Rebar, our old friend in the metals land, Steel Rebar just – Blowing the doors off everything else on the Shanghai Futures Exchange. That's another one where I, contract specs may come into uh, play there. Let's look at the ever exciting other uh, <laughs> methanol futures. <laughs> Doing pretty active. Again, got to dig down a little bit to find the options. So I, I encourage you. What was the listener's name? I'm getting lost in the weeds of all this data. Listener's name is EKG3. I encourage you, FIA.org. Or again, Mr. Rhodes' research over there at Tab Group touching on this as well. Those two spots, I think. Uh, will serve you well. We could spend another hour and a half digging through this mountain of data here. Unfortunately, we have more show to do here, more questions to answer. Um, let's go to Elliot. Kind of an interesting fundamental question. He wants to know, why do some products do large futures volume but small options volume? Doesn't one usually lead to the other? <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Rhodes, this is kind of a, a topic we've touched on a little bit recently on the show here. People have asked about specific products, why they don't do a lot of options volume. It is kind of an interesting little bit of line of demarcation how a paper will trade in the futures, but for a variety of reasons, maybe there aren't, there hasn't been a big hedging community that's sprung up, hasn't been a lot of need to write calls against it, so the options haven't really taken off from that perspective. For whatever reason, the primary use case, primary liquidity has aggregated in the futures in a lot of these products. What do you have to say here for Mr. Elliott? He wants to know, why is that? Why are some people playing in the futures and the options are kind of just uh, twisted on the vine? Uh, yeah, you, you've kind of covered the main ones there. That It, it, it depends on uh, the product use with respect to the derivatives. If you've got uh, you know, market participants that want to hedge one direction but not necessarily another direction, um, they're, they're going to be more active in the option market when you get those types of players that I hate to say it this way, but are okay with losing money on their option position uh, that brings the liquidity providers in because they are the ones that really want to take the other side of those trades. So, you know, if you don't have the legitimate users 
uh, you're not going to have a, uh, a successful derivatives market period. And I think that's probably even more so within the uh, within the option space that you just do need uh, unidirectional hedging going on in order to bring. I hate to I hate to say dumb money as well, but again, the people that are willing to, uh, you know, pay a little bit above the fair value or sell a little bit below the fair value because they've got they're not interested in the short term outcome and they're not delta neutral hedging. But you can't make any money delta neutral trading unless you have the other guy. So uh, that really is why we end up seeing some futures markets, which are okay if you have nothing but speculators. Um, but you need to also have a different type of market participant to make the option market work. Whoa. Yes, yes, indeed, sir. Unfortunately. Or perhaps fortunately, maybe as my voice is is coming to its end, <laughs> that music means we're uh, we're pretty much done here. Unfortunately, we got a few some more questions. We want to get to all of you, of course, but I don't think my voice has much left, and I got to save it for some more shows <laughs> for later this week and early next week. So, so that music, unfortunately, means we have drawn to a close this episode of Twifo. But before we go, Mr. Rhodes, if folks are intrigued. Uh, that report you just mentioned. Maybe they want to check it out for themselves. They want to, they want to see your your volume research and all the other research you're doing over there in derivatives land and tab. Where should they go? What should they do? And also, if you got any hints, any teases for some cool upcoming reports, now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. I know this is this is my moment. Um, well, first off, it's tabforum.com. I know you have to register. We do not charge you anything when you register. Uh, so, you know, don't worry about that. And then the big thing that we're working on right now, and it's, it's why my voice is under a little bit of pressure, uh, we're doing our annual outreach uh, um, where we talk to buy-side option traders about what they're seeing, maybe how they're executing a little bit differently and things along those lines. And anybody that participates in the survey gets a copy of the report when we're done with it early next year. So, that's a big part of what we're doing right now. So if folks want to be a part of that, do they just go to tab form? Do they reach out to you uh, directly? How they re- they reach out to me, rroads at tabgroup.com, or hit me on Twitter, and I'll give you my email address. I'm not very – I don't hide. I'm easy to find. rroads at tab group. That's R-H-O-A-D-S, listeners. So it's not the roads like you drive on, or even the roads like the island. No, it's his own – he's his own beast. <laughs> and you can follow him over there on the old Twitters as well as I suddenly can't find your handle. There we go. You're at Russell Rhodes. Pretty easy. Two L's. Don't forget the two L's, listeners. You give him a follow over there as well. So he tweets out a lot of links to his research throughout the week when he's not making appearances on this fine program. And of course, you can check out that research from Blue. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let him know. Let us know. You can find it for yourself. Read the full thing with the charts and all the analysis there. I encourage you to do that. That was called, remember, how Aramco IPO will change oil dynamics. You can find that as well as all the TWIFO tools and everything else. CMEgroup.com is the place to go. And on behalf of Mr. Rhodes and our friends over there at CME and our buddy Sean, who's out partying somewhere in Florida right now, and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing. Of course, if you want all that small cap ball and data, Footsie Russell, F-T-S-E, Russell.com is the place to go. Give them a follow on the old Twitters as well while you're at it, at FTSE Russell. And, of course, we'll see you back here tomorrow for more volatility views, 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern. Our buddy, Mr. Mr. Simon, back from T3 to talk some interesting new futures on the market. And, of course, we kick it all off again on Monday. Actually, next Thursday, of course, is indeed Thanksgiving holiday. Here in the U.S., so no show here next week. You're going to get a best of. So we'll see you back here in two weeks for more of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. 
Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Quick Strike One. That's Q U I K S T R I K E One. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 futures and options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs> 